Welcome to another episode of Pursuing God, the life of King David. I'm very thankful that you would, would join us here in this, in this format. My name is Jason Reeves. I'm the, the preaching minister here at the, the Eastridge Church of Christ in Rockwall, Texas. This is Kurt Covington. Kurt and his family worship with us here at, at Eastridge. Kurt's one of our, our deacons. Uh, the two of us traditionally teach a, a Sunday morning class together, but uh, here lately we've been, we've been going about things in, uh, in this way. Uh, and presenting uh, a few lessons on uh, the life of King David, just considering uh, his lifetime a step at a time. And so last time we were together, we talked about some of the, some of the facets that, that led up to uh, this, this clash uh, with, with David and, and Goliath. And so this week, uh, Kurt is going to, to, to lead us through the event, the, the event of David versus Goliath uh, itself. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we'll read a little bit about the battle, we'll finish out the battle, and then we're going to draw six applications from the battle. And we're going to go freeze frame by freeze frame. It's a, I hate to use the word fun, but it, it's a really fun thing to do when you can just take little aspects of the battle, of the single combat between David and Goliath, take these small aspects, and then draw out an application from it and apply it to how we fight giants as Christians today. So the, the theme of this and the theme of these applications is when David's beat Goliaths, what do they do? And, and, then those and then we can draw that out and we can take it and we can go use these things in our lives as, as Christians, as <clears throat> people in the workforce, as ministers. When we face Goliaths, how do we operate? So before, as we do that, I, I do want to start. We touched a little bit on this last time when David puts on the armor, but it's such a good... Uh, it's such a good and critical part of the story that I want to start in 1 Samuel 17, and we're going to go to verse 38. So 1 Samuel 17, 38. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go in these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David <clears throat> with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me. And I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come at me with sword and spear and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Verse 48, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to David to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And then the Philistines see their champion is dead. They go on, they flee. The Israelites chase and follow in pursuit and a great victory is won that day. But let's slow this down. Let's, let's look at frame by frame what happens and how David beats Goliath. First, first point, and there will be a handout that we can send out, and I encourage you to work through the handout as we go through these points. Um, it, when we teach Bible class, a lot of times we like to give out a handout. Mm -hmm. uh, people like to hold something and work through it, and so we'll do that virtually. You can print it up or open it up on your, on your electronic device yeah. and follow along with us. But the first point, on when David's beat Goliaths. So when little guys beat giants, number one, they fight on their own terms. They fight in what they're comfortable with. Look at what David says, 
back at where we started. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. And he takes his staff, he takes his, his stu- smooth stones, he's got his pouch in his shepherd's bag, and he's got his sling. David goes in what he's comfortable with. One interesting point, in single-hand combat in those days in the Near East, to approach as a slinger a guy with a sword, that would have been bucking social convention. It's going to be sword versus sword. Mm. So the first thing David does is not only does he go in what he's comfortable with, he doesn't care what other people think about that. He's going to go with what he likes to use, what he's comfortable using, what he's skillful at using, even though he may be despised, as we see later, for that choice. So how do we, how do we draw that to today? And what I do in, in some classes where, where we'll teach lawyers and, and talk to young lawyers, I tell them, look, there's a way that, that the old dogs like to do things. Mm. There's an there's a established way, and, and sometimes that may seem like the only way. But you, in your uniqueness, need to channel David. And it's funny, yesterday I gave a talk, um, and I used this very verse in, in a presentation to other lawyers, and I, and I talked about it in trying to teach lawyers under 40. You've got to be you, but you need to use the tools you're comfortable with. For example, in law, we, we go into trial and you've got a dolly and you've got these boxes with, with binders and documents and we love paper. And lawyers love paper and I, I don't know how many trees are killed for trial, <laughs> but we've got binders and documents and, and that seems to be the way to do things. But early on in my career, I got good with the iPad and there was some, now everyone takes iPads everywhere to trial. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's not as cool as it was in, in back back in the day. I was going to say, with that, with that old dog, new dog sort of conversation, where are you at in there? You're kind of in the middle. Yeah, of I'm, I'm right in the middle. <laughs> exactly. Just like the millennials cuts off. Uh, I'm too old to be a millennial, but too young to be Gen X. There's this lost generation. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm the lost generation. But, but I tell them, if you're comfortable with something different, don't be afraid to go use something different. That's what David did here. So in drawing that first thing out, it's you fight on your own terms and you go with what you're comfortable with. Mm. Yeah, it even seems like that um, as, the, as the events being described, uh, there is that reiteration toward the end of what you read that David went against Goliath and he had victory over him without a sword. I mean, that was, that was reiterated there at the end mm-hmm. because that would have been the convention of the day. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And a sub point in this is finding your method and relentlessly deploying it. <laughs> What do I mean by that? Well, David, before this, and we talked about this last week in, in Jason's lesson, he had done this against the bear and the lion, mm-hmm. and, and we didn't, he may have punched the lion with his fist, but yeah. he got good with his sling. Mm-hmm. So he had a method, that's what he was gonna use. Find your method and relentlessly deploy it. Listen to this stat. If a rat is faced with a puzzle in which food is placed on its left, or camera left, 60% of the time, and on the right, 40% of the time, it will quickly deduce that the left side is more rewarding and it will head there every time, thus achieving a 60% success rate. Young children adopt the same strategy, 60% success rate. When Yale undergraduates play the game, they try to figure out some underlying pattern and they end up doing worse than the rat or the child. We can really be too clever for our own good. Hmm. David had his method. He wasn't going to change it. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to God's providence and God fighting for David. But just in terms of the physical tools he's using to fight that giant, he was going to go with what he had. Yeah. Yeah. For for, for David to say that this is, uh, I cannot go in these. Uh, And for for Saul, who's not leading Israel, Saul, who's who's not stepping into this this role of king, um, Saul, who's fearful of, of Goliath, uh, and who's already said, okay, if, if whoever steps forward, and we kind of skip, I kind of skipped this last week, but Saul, who's already said, whoever steps forward and does this, um, I'm going to give all of these, I'm going to give all of these things to that person. Mm-hmm. But Saul, who's fearful of stepping into that role himself, and then for David, but for, but Saul's trying to help David out. Here, try on this armor. What about this sword? What about using these these things? And for David to say, no, I'm, I'm going to go with what I'm comfortable with. What's tried and what's true and what's and what's uniquely used the language. What's uniquely mm-hmm. uniquely me. Um, so I may be stepping on your toes, but uh, with the five smooth stones, uh, there there is some speculation uh, later on in scripture. We we learn that Goliath Goliath had four brothers, yeah. and so there, there's always been the there's always been the question um, for many of us of 
Why five? I mean, he he trusts God. It only takes it only takes the one. Why why five stones? Is it some sort of Pentateuch? Some sort of you know this, this number five? Is that's what is is that what uh, what's significant here? Um, but later on in Scripture, we we learn that that um, that Goliath had four other brothers, and so who knows? Maybe those four other stones are for are or for them. I mean, it's interesting to speculate. A brother, yeah, a brother coming out of the woodwork, or if you just don't even think about the brothers, there's nothing wrong with preparation. There's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with being prepared. Okay. David's not trusting God for that first shot. He's trusting God to give him the victory. Mm-hmm. David may not know how that victory is going to come about. Mm-hmm. Maybe this will be a long fight where David's got to run around him a bunch of times and sling a bunch of stones, and maybe okay. he ends up using his sling in some other way. But um, just being prepared, good. just because we trust God doesn't mean we don't go to battle prepared. That's good. And then another point is uh, letting God use you. And God's going to use you, and you mentioned uniquely you, but also uniquely in your weakness. God doesn't have a lot of room for strong people. About three or four weeks ago, we talked about 1 Corinthians, mm-hmm. God not choosing, God choosing the weak things of the world to shame the wise, um, the foolish to shame the wise, and the weak to shame the strong. Mm-hmm. It's hard if you've got everything together and you, and you are Mr. Worldly Power. Well, how can God use a person like that? But who he can use is a 16, 15 year old guy, a little skinny kid that can't even wear the armor of the day. Oh, God can use a guy like that Mm. because it's about the glory of God at the end of the day. And we'll look at this at point two when when David starts his trash talk. It's not about I'm going to beat you up. It's about what God's going to do. So let's go to point two. The second thing David's do when they beat Goliath is, is they give credit to God. David does that right off the bat. And he's not afraid of trash talk. So David said to the Philistine, we're picking up in uh, verse 45, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Holy cow, David. Today I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air. So this is single combat, and he's, David's already like, Oh, after I beat you, we're going to give the carcasses of your whole army. To the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. So let me back up. We read about Goliath. He says a little bit of something to David. It's like, hey, come here. I'm going to, mm-hmm. in my dog, you come at me yeah, with sticks, and, and come here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip you up. I'm going to give your body to the beasts of the field. Well, David, it's almost like David goes, oh, okay, you want to talk trash? Okay. Okay, okay, we'll do that. <laughs> and then he, he launches into a paragraph of not what I'm going to do to you, but what my God's going to do to you. And the world will know that there's a God in Israel. So, yes, he's talking a lot of guff, as you could call it, but it's about what God's going to do. And it's, a, it's, again, it's about standing up for the Lord and that hot indignation that David felt that we talked about last time. It's for the glory of God. Hmm. And it's the glory of God that's being defied. It's not, I'm better than you, I'm going to beat you up. It's my God can do that for, for you. I think for a lot of us, we may need to talk a little bit more trash like that. And the trash talk isn't, again, me. It's not about me. It's about putting yourself out there by making a claim about how good your God is. How often in the last week, in the last month, in the last year, have you gone out and said, Either God will provide or God's going to see me through the situation or told somebody something about how God's going to mm-hmm. rescue you. That takes risk because it takes an act of faith to say something about God that you know is true. But you, you almost kind of want to leave God now. Like if, if he doesn't come through, David doesn't do that. And so I think for a lot of us, even if we don't talk it to someone else, I'm not saying let's go out and make a bunch of promises that are unscriptural about God. But it should be a faith action in our hearts that we feel that God is going to rescue us and take care of us. And we could probably use a little bit more of that. Yeah. You know, I think about um, social media and maybe maybe my uh, uh, even though even though I do I do Facebook. That's the only that's the only thing that I do. Uh, maybe maybe it's just because I'm simplistic. I need one thing to focus on. If if if, yeah. if, if I'm going to have it, this is what I'm going to have. But some of my disdain, I think, for social media is uh, um, is there is this this focus on on the individual, 
Mm-hmm. And, and almost like, well, if, if, if you don't post <coughs> this, if, if, if you don't say this, you don't take a picture of this, it didn't actually happen. Right. And, uh, and I think there's, there's some aversion to that, which I think is, is healthy. Um, but just thinking about how social media is, uh, is, is ever present with, with society and getting to know maybe an individual through the things that they post on social media and how sometimes that can be very frustrating. Um, and especially for somebody that you do, you do know well, and you're like, no, you're, you're, such, you're so much of a better, you have such a better focus than this. You, you're, you're such a better person than this. And even sometimes, <clears throat> or too often, from Christians with the things mm-hmm. that are focused upon. And this, if, there, if, there, if there somehow could be this shift in, in this is what, this is what God is doing. This is who God. This is who God is. Just what a paradigm shift that would be for so many, and especially for us to trust God in the middle of something where there's there's uncertainty. I don't know. I don't know what the end result for this is going to be. Whatever this is in my life, but I know that that God is going to to accomplish His purposes in precisely the way that He sees fit. And I'm going to mm-hmm. be. And I'm going to be good. With, and I'm going to be good with that. You know, it's about about being about being a person who is not only after God's heart, but also a person who is content with God's will. Yeah, and, and if I were teaching a middle school or high school class, I think a great project and an interesting project would be to assign you, my middle school or high school or audience with, why don't you give me the tweet or the Facebook post that David was posting before the fight and give me the tweet or Facebook post that he's posting after. Wow, yeah. And then compare and contrast that to, <coughs> to what your heart would be wanting to post. but. I want you to post something scriptural that David would have posted, mm. and so because you know it's going to be about God and about God. But then compare and contrast that to what you would have done. You know, you got the picture of Goliath's head with the selfie, right. and, <laughs> and you're and you're putting that out there. It, <laughs> David probably would have done it differently yeah. than we would have done it. I think that'd be a good project. All right. So the the third point: How do Davids beat Goliath? Point number three: They press. They speed up the encounter which can freeze the giant. You do something unexpected as David does, and you can freeze the giant. Picking up in verse 48, as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out the stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down to the ground. So what does David do? I think Goliath probably expects David to kind of walk up and let's let's get this battle started the conventional way. Let's let's get our swords out. Or David's coming at him with a stick and a sling. Mm-hmm. Goliath may not know what he's doing, but come on, let's get it going. David does something completely unexpected, and he sprints right at Goliath. So there's that element of surprise, and he froze Goliath. David was able to get the sling off, and we know in those days slingers could be deadly accurate, and the stone could be going extremely fast, pretty much like a bullet, and and it could immobilize Goliath as it did here. But the, the kind of sub point here is this is a harder method to do. It's harder to be unconventional. It's harder to do the unexpected. And it's easier to sit back and, and be the conventional way. And Malcolm Gladwell has written a little bit on this. And he's got an article in The New Yorker uh, on David and Goliath. He talks about, and it, it's interesting, it, I don't think it's exactly a Christian perspective, but on this point, it's interesting to pull out, pull out some of the application. There's a, a girls' basketball team he writes about, and this team was full of girls that, that just played soccer, and they had no business playing basketball. But there was one good basketball player. It was Roger Craig. If you remember Roger Craig running back for, I believe, the 49ers, his daughter was pretty good. So he had a bunch of girls that were fast, had no, couldn't even use their hands that well. But then they had one girl who they could dump it off to. The coach was from India or Pakistan, but he was unfamiliar with the U.S. He read the rules, and the rules say you can press. But if you watch a basketball game in the U.S., how do games go? They go and they score, then everyone retreats, and they allow the other team to throw the ball in. Mm -hmm. This coach, this foreign guy, was perplexed as to why would you give up that advantage so quickly after you put the ball in, the other team has to throw it in, why do you retreat? So in his perspective, he thought, let's press. I've got these girls that can't really play that conventional way. I'm going to offend a lot of people by pressing all game, every game, and not stopping. 
but it's a different type of basketball, and he, he doesn't know the conventional way, so he did this unconventional way. They ended up going to nationals with all these girls that didn't play, but along the way, there were fights in the parking lot. There were parents threatening to, to hurt him and kill him because he wasn't doing it conventionally, and it was harder. It was a harder method to do because the girls had to be in shape. They had to be running the whole time. It's a lot easier just to go score, retreat back, kind of get a break, gather yourself, but the, you're letting the other team get the ball and when you do that. But to be on 100% all the time, it's harder. So the point there is it can be harder to press. It can be harder to speed up the encounter. For David to run a Goliath with his sling, that's a harder thing to do mm -hmm. from a skill perspective than to sit back with the sword. But to run with the sling and, and fling the stone, that's difficult. Second thing, and I've got this in the handout, if you know anything about Lawrence of Arabia, and some of his efforts during World War I, it's exhausting to be Lawrence of Arabia and to have to ride 600 miles through the desert on the back of a camel to surprise an enemy. Just like it's much harder to sling a stone and nail someone in the forehead. It's, it's harder to give out that effort. So in, in the, the final point on this is, many times we think that skill is the precious resource. So the ability with the sword is the precious resource. And then effort is the commodity that anyone can just have effort. But it could actually be the other way around, where anyone can develop skill, but not everyone wants to give out the effort. So in our battles against Goliath, press, speed up the encounter, we freeze Goliath, and, and that's a harder thing to do than to just sit back and be conventional. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, first of all, as a guy who played uh, low post all the way up through high school, um, yeah, the idea of pressing the entire the entire time. You wanted your break. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, that that would have that would have been tough. Um, and uh, and then also thinking about um, we we want to we want to focus upon David's trust of trust of God, um, but there is also this confidence, and you you've brought this out. There is this confidence in not only what is familiar, but with what with what he knows and with what works. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think for, for us, this, this fine line, you know, there's, there's that line between confidence and arrogance. There's no arrogance in, in, uh, in, in David or even arrogance in David's uh, trash talk, uh, right. but, but, there, but there's confidence and there's, there's confidence in who God is, but there's also confidence in who he is um, as a human being created in God's image and as one who belongs to God. There is, there's no doubt in David's mind that 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 he's going to be victorious. Perhaps he doesn't fully know how that's going to take place. But there's no doubt in David's mind that he's going to be victorious. And he says it a number of times, how, in, in different ways. How can I possibly lose? This guy is opposing God, and I'm with God. And so there's confidence that David has, yes, in God. But there's also confidence that he has in himself. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Point four: When David's beat Goliath they are despised. So when the young beats the old, when the unconventional beats the conventional, you can be despised. Look at 1 Samuel 17, 42. Goliath looked over at David and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. Hmm. And, then, and then they do the trash talk. And then can you imagine after what David says, the way Goliath felt, like, <clears throat> I'm gonna get rid of you right now. So he was despised. The price you pay for being so heedless of custom is the disapproval of the insider, the conventional guy like Goliath. Goliath doesn't dwarf David. He brings the full force of social convention against him. He has contempt for David. Which makes me think of a, a couple applications. One, in being a Christian, Mark 13, 13, Jesus says, all men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. You're going to be in your Christian walk, and there's going to be times when you're putting yourself out there for God, or you're putting yourself in a situation, and you're despised, or people come against you, and that's because of your faith. But know that all men will hate you because of me. I mean, Jesus told us that. He didn't say everything's going to be rosy. I'm going to, I'm going to save you from your sins. You're going to walk in this faith. You're going to have this newness of life. You're going to have a new heart. You're a new creation. You're adopted as a son by God, and it's all going to be great. No, it's... And it could be a rocky road. In fact, all men will hate you because of me is a pretty tough promise to swallow. But it's good to know that it's out there. That way I can expect it. And David experienced it. So that, that hatred that can come from being young and bucking convention and going against the old guy is, is something I've experienced. I mean, mm -hmm. in law practice, 
when when I was a younger lawyer, you you get a lot of abuse and you get it from the old dogs. It's, it was always amusing to me when you attend some of these talks early on and, and, and lawyers are lawyers are notorious for sometimes being abusive to each other. And that's never changed. And it's probably not going to change. But old lawyers would love to sit back and talk about, man, the practice just it's not what it used to be. The collegiality has gone. The civility has gone. And as a young guy, I'm thinking, what? <laughs> every time I've been on the receiving end of abuse, it hadn't been from a young guy. It's been <laughs> from an old guy right. trying to get some sort of advantage on me or trying to intimidate me, right. which is what Goliath is doing here. And know that you're in good company, that when that happens to you, David walked through it. And how did David handle it? He's got faith in God. He knows that God will save him. And if I could just emulate and adopt some of the lack of care that David has of what others think of him, I'd be doing well. Yeah. It's obvious to me that David really doesn't give two thoughts as to what people care about him. And when you read further in the Psalms, and you read Psalm 18, a Psalm of, of, of victory, and you read uh, some of the other Psalms, David really put himself out there. And, and while he may have, I'm sure we all care a little bit what people think of us, but he had a really huge lack of care about what other, pe- yeah. other people thought of him. And we would do well to emulate that. You know, there's a couple of things that come to mind just with the with the language or the, the wording of uh, Goliath despising David. You know, he says what he says, and then he despises him. First thing that comes to mind um, is uh, is the description of the prophets of, of Jesus, who's despised and rejected. Uh, and I think this connects to what to what mm-hmm. you've just said. In somehow in an hour, seeing ourselves in when we encounter adversity. Um, whatever that adversity looks like, to, to look to Christ. You know, that, that's a, a, a huge part of God in the flesh, God in Christ, is our having that example of Jesus and recognizing that he encountered everything that we encounter. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, quote, to quote the Hebrew author, except was without, was, that, was without sin. So the first thing that comes to mind is just Jesus being despised and rejected. Uh, maybe a secondary uh, sort of thing that comes to mind is when Paul writes, uh, writes to Timothy and says, don't, don't let others look down upon you because, because you're young. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you know, we tend to just apply that to, you know, how, how many youth retreats have you been kind of built around that? We kind of tend to just apply that to um, those that maybe we in our culture and society would consider young. Um, odds are Timothy was probably uh, between 30 and 40 whenever Paul writes that to him. Um, and just because of the conventions of the of, of the day, and I, I think that especially when it comes to how we view ourselves and how we view how others view us, if you're tracking mm-hmm. with me, mm-hmm. how we how we see ourselves, and then how we see ourselves um, in maybe the concern, maybe the the over concern we might have for how others view us, um, and, and 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 I like the direction that that, that you're bringing us as far as as far as you know, whether or not that carries a lot of bandwidth with mm-hmm. us to, to that, that line between confidence and arrogance, but to have the confidence in, in saying, I don't, have, I don't have it all figured out, but I'm just gonna try to be as faithful to God as I can be. And ultimately, that's where my validation comes from. My validation comes from, from God, from who I am in God's eyes, and for, and for how I'm attempting to, to live my life, and especially with regard to, to criticism uh, I, I included a little bit of this in uh, uh, in my sermon last last Sunday. When it comes to criticism from from others, uh, you know, a, 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 a critic doesn't risk very much. Right. Someone offers up their their work or their um, artistry or their craft, whatever whatever it is. Uh, someone offer offers that whether it's a you know whether whether it's a, a, an attorney or or whether it's a, a preacher or or whether it's a, a chef making food or a painter that paints what, mm-hmm. whatever it is someone offers up their work and someone else comes along and tells you know just this is this is what I think of this and really what all they've offered is is criticism mm-hmm. uh, and and to to have this confidence in uh, in trusting God and and I think also this this level of confidence with um, with just being who we are this natural somehow somehow. We don't quite understand. We don't quite know where we end and Jesus begins because we're He's such a part of who we are, and I think there's confidence in that. Yeah, and so so many people's main struggle in life is is getting validation from external sources, mm-hmm. including other people, mm-hmm. and living your life 
so as to get that validation and to get that nugget. We know that that's sinful because validation comes from God. And can you imagine if Jesus lived to try to not offend other people? I mean, sometimes, sometimes in my world, I'm like, oh, gosh, I offended somebody or I don't want to offend somebody and I can't offend them. I mean, imagine if our Savior, who we're told to emulate, tried to walk the line to where he wasn't going to offend everybody. I mean, I, I can't turn two pages in, in some of the New Testament books without seeing Jesus offending <laughs> lots of people. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just the way that, that you walk. You walk to please God. Mm-hmm. So fifth point on how David's beat Goliath. They don't wait their turn. They dominate now. So David didn't wait till he was old enough, strong enough, or well-trained. He fought with the tools he had. Mm -hmm. And if you look, it kind of rankles his older brother, Eliab, when he goes to the battle site. Eliab says in the king, (laughs) well, Eliab says, why'd you come here? Troublemaker. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Why aren't you with those few sheep? And I like the King James Version of what he says is, why camest thou down hither? Why camest thou down (laughs) hither? I imagine him on a stump with his arm (laughs) raised. But why'd you come here, punk? Why, where did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? And what's, what's his point in saying few sheep in the wilderness? Uh-huh. I think it's to try to raise himself in the eyes of his comrades. Like, here comes my little brother. Let me, let me try to denigrate him a little bit so that I look better. But you see that David's not waiting his turn. Older brothers are there. They had their shot. He's 16, and he says, look, I'm a rookie, but I'm going to come in, and I know I'm good. I know I'm the best player on the field. I'm going to dominate now. And I think we can really take something from that. You look at great athletes, they don't wait their turn. They start going at it, and they catch a lot of adversity. I'm a, I'm a huge Spurs fan. And when Tim Duncan when Tim Duncan came into the league, he was called too skinny and too light by Shaq, who was the Goliath mm-hmm. of the day. Mm-hmm. Well, now Tim Duncan's regarded as the greatest power forward of all time. You don't wait your turn. If, if you've got the skills, you've got the tools, if you've got the faith, if you're in the right area of ministry or you're in the right career, you go and you do your thing now and you put your trust in God. And, and if you have to buck social convention, you do that. And I take that from David. The, the kid mm-hmm. didn't wait until he was old enough. He went and did it when he could. And to any young people listening, that is a great lesson for you. And I, and I think that's part of the reason why so many, so many kids love David and Goliath is because here we have a kid that beats up the, the best warrior of the day. Mm-hmm. It's a victory for the youth. Yeah, I think... There's something to be learned of uh, striving to be who who God calls you to be within the context that you find yourself. There's nothing there's nothing wrong with making plans for the future. There's nothing wrong with an anticipation. There's nothing, there's no, nothing wrong with with trying to to set goals and attain those goals. I think those things are important. Mm-hmm. But sometimes in doing that, we we can even miss the opportunities that God places in front of us in the lives that we're living that we're living today. And, and I think if we'll, if we'll try to embrace that sort, of, that sort of objectivity, that sort of perspective, we'll find ourselves living lives that are, that are more fully lived in the kingdom of God. We're not constantly living for the next step or the next thing or, or what's coming down, down, the, lo- down the line is, is maybe as important as those things are, but trying to utilize the gifts that God has given us within the context that we find ourselves. And so, um, being those who are a people of, of the kingdom and the mission of the kingdom, whether that is is going around to the other side of the globe or whether whether that's uh, going across the, the living room. Right. Um, in, in recognizing that God has, you know, David as a shepherd, David as a shepherd of, of sheep, even as, as Eliab uh, makes fun of him for that. Mm-hmm. A few sheep. I mean, how... How wealthy was Jesse? I mean, you exactly. know, he, he's just he's just downplaying his role. But David, as a as a shepherd of sheep, and then David as a shepherd of God's people, um, and David, of course, who gives us Psalm twenty three: "The Lord is my shepherd." Seeing God as this as this person who as is this entity that is is nurturing and caring for his sheep. Um, each and every one of us have these pastoral roles, these shepherding roles in the lives that we live. That may be. In, in the context of work with a, with a large environment. Um, I, I appreciate you, you were talking about the, the, uh, the instruction that you gave, the hour long instruction you gave yesterday to, to, to 200 attorneys, and, right. then, and yet you, you include an, an illustration of David and Goliath. Absolutely. You know, how, how awesome is that? Um, but then, you, then you've also got you know, a, a wife and four kiddos at home, and you know, this, this pastoral sort of um, role that each of us plays within the different varying contexts that we find ourselves, mm-hmm. and, and and we see that we see that in David, 
And David, though young, if he goes out and he uses that skill that God has given him, and that's our lesson is that we're not called to go out and be cocky and, and go out and not learn under other people and not be willing to receive instruction and not be willing to know, not be willing to admit, I don't really know much in this particular field. Can you help me? That's not what we're called to do. What we're called to do is if God has given you a calling and he's given you a skill, you better go use it mm. and, and be humble when you use it and give glory to God. But it's time to go use that. So sixth point, when David's be Goliath, they are relentless. I want to give you a window into David's head here. And we're going to go to Psalm 18 and we're going to go to verse 37. Psalm 18, 37. This is David writing. He's talking about his enemies. I pursued my enemies and overtook them. I did not turn back until they were consumed. I thrust them through so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me, and those who hated me I destroyed. They cried for help, but there was no one to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. And then here's the, the key verse, 42. I beat them as fine as dust born on the wind. I cast them out like the mire of the street. I don't know how much later David wrote that song, because it says he wrote it when he was delivered from the hand mm -hmm. of all his enemies and mm -hmm. from Saul. So we know that this was a time later. But that's kind of a window into the mindset of the warrior that David was. He wasn't just happy that he got in, he beat Goliath, he did some good things, and I kind of got in, got out, did some good, thank you for the experience. Mm -hmm. He says, no, I'm going to go and I'm going to get a complete victory. For example, there's no friendly battle with Goliath. David cut off Goliath's head. You know, He didn't just sink him in the ground, he cut off Goliath's head, and at one point, towards the end of chapter 17, mm -hmm. you've got Abner, the chief of the army, trying to bring David to Saul. David's holding the head with him. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it's kind of gross when you think about it, but it is a relentless attitude towards the fight. So once David's in the fight, it's, yes, God's going to save me, but I'm giving every single bit of my effort mm -hmm. to win a complete victory and not turn back until it's complete. Hmm. Yeah, Ephesians 6 <clears throat> comes, comes to mind with the, the, the armor of God, you know, as the Apostle Paul is, is describing, you know, put, put on the armor of God, you know, and, and you think of, you think of, of, of David in, in being who he is, being equipped um, with, with what, he's, what he's accustomed to, and then utilizing the things that have been given to him, or the things that have been entrusted to him, utilizing um, who he is in order to be able to, to accomplish uh, this task, which ultimately is a is a task that um, that is of God's design, um, and is in in David's life. I mean, again, I, I guess it was uh, in in the last episode. I I said there's there's probably no more event in in David's life, maybe even no more event in the Bible that gets more VBS time than yeah. David <laughs> than, than David and Goliath. But we point to that event because it's a pivotal moment. It's a pivotal moment for for David that catapults him. Um, in, in his leadership of, of Israel. Um, as a matter of fact, there are, there are songs that will, be, that will be sung that, you know, that, uh, you know, yeah, Saul killed his thousands, but David is mm -hmm. 10,000, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and so it's, it's one of the things that catapults David into this prominent role within his leadership of Israel, but it's all because of God. It's all because of what God makes possible. It, and it's absolutely, and, and that's a great point. It comes, these are, these are neat things to pull out and to kind of get tips from, from the word of God and how David did it. But the only reason David was in that position is because God was looking for a man after his own heart. Mm. He saw the heart of David. He saw the faith. And he says, I'm going to raise that guy up. Mm. And we talked about this in, in the first two episodes, that having that heart is the very first step in ascending in the kingdom of God or doing well in your work or doing well in anything. It's to have the heart that wants to please God. You so, know, Psalm, Psalm 18, whenever you... you, you uh when you initially said Psalm 18, I'm like, oh, he's going to verses one through three. Oh yeah, yeah. And, yeah, then, right. and, then, and then you, you skip uh -huh. down further because da because down further is this relentlessness of mm -hmm. relentlessness of of David um, in in pursuing his enemies. But the first few verses of are, you know, I love, I love you, you, O Lord, my strength. Yeah. The Lord is my rock, you know, my fortress, mm -hmm. my deliverer, uh, my stronghold, and uh, you know, that personal language uh, that David utilizes of this is who God is, and because this is who God is. This is who this is who I can be, mm -hmm. and that that's a great point. That's that's how David starts the song. I love you, mm -hmm. Lord, my strength. Mm -hmm. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. He's telling he's telling God about his heart again. Mm -hmm. He's saying, God, I give you my heart. 
But then he goes forward and, and, and the psalm goes yep. in a couple different directions. Then you catch the relentlessness. Mm -hmm. But it starts with the heart that goes, that loves God. Mm -hmm. So fi final note, there is an element of glory to God that God chose the really, really small against the really, really big. And he made both of them ridiculously small and ridiculously big so that it would be completely obvious that he did this and that all glory would be to him. Mm. And that's, that gets back to God being able to use you. He can use the small, he can use the weak so that it is he who gets the glory and not us because it's he who deserves the glory mm. and not us. It is he who created the world, he who saved us. It's he who has his hand behind it all. He should get the glory. That's the proper place for it to rest. So with that, uh, we look forward to talking to you next time, and I'll close us in prayer. Dear Lord God, we thank you for the example of David and the, the lessons we can draw from David and Goliath. And Lord, we thank you for your providence and your love that wrote this down in Scripture for us. And, and we trust, Lord, this was an actual event with real people that actually happened. And the struggles sometimes that we face, face with are so small compared to what David had to do to Goliath in front of all of his peers, in front of the army of Israel, in front of the king, and in front of the enemy army. Lord, you gave him the faith to go out there and to say the things he said, to put the trust in you, and to win the battle. And Father, we, we put that same trust in you. We pray that you give us that kind of heart and that kind of faith that when we go out and we're faced with situations and we're faced with Goliaths, that we can tap into your resources and tap into these lessons and win the day. Lord God, we thank you so much for the example of Jesus. Uh, we pray that you watch over us and our children and our families this week. Pray for this church family, Father, that you continue to navigate us through these times and that all glory goes to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you next time.